In this video, we'll be looking at the structure of the cell surface membrane, or sometimes we refer to them as plasma membranes. Um, in particular, you just need to know uh, the different structures that make up the membrane and also their different functions. Okay, so first of all, here you can see that's the general layout of how it generally looks like, and that is what we call the fluid mosaic model. First of all, it's fluid because generally everything can actually move quite a lot. So, uh, for example, some of these phospholipids can actually float along, or even sometimes uh, certain proteins will be able to move along the membrane. So they are not fixed in one place. And it's also referred to as mosaic because uh, you can see there are different uh, structures, different things that are all, all of different shape and sizes, and they are still able to fit together in one membrane. So therefore we call it the fluid mosaic model. And as you can see that we've got the external side, which means that this side is the tissue fluid. And on this side is the internal side, so this is the cytoplasm. So imagine if this is a cell surface membrane or plasma membrane that goes along the outside of a cell. Cytoplasm here and uh, tissue fluid there. The plasma membrane is a um, phospholipid bilayer. And as you can see these individual circles with the two tails, uh, that's actually individually a phospholipid. You may already know this from uh, the chapter 3 about biochemistry, the biological molecules. Uh, you will know that a, a lipid molecule such as a phospholipid will be made of one phosphate head, one glycerol molecule and also two fatty acid cells. So in the fluid mosaic model, in order to simplify that, we just use this particular um, sort of uh, diagram. So this one represents the uh, hydrophilic phosphate head. And the two legs here would represent the hydrophobic uh, fatty acid cells. And in reality, yes, we should have the glycerol molecule sort of linking these two different things together. But to simplify that, we use this particular symbol. It is really important to know that the, the head, the phosphate head, is hydrophilic, which means water-loving. And the cells are hydrophobic, which means they hate water. Um, and, and these two properties basically uh, ensure that the bilayer is formed. So if we look back to this one here, as you can see, because the hydrophilic heads, uh, they don't mine water, so they would face outwards or inwards facing the water um, envir watery environment in some sense. Whereas the tails, because they're hydrophobic, they would shield themselves away from the water, forming what we call a hydrophobic core. And because there are two layers of them, we call therefore we call this whole thing the uh, phospholipid bilayer. In terms of some of the general functions of plasma membranes or membranes in general uh, would be compartmentalization. So as the name implies, it just simply means how we would put uh, different things into separate areas. So that is crucial, especially when you want to have a certain area just doing a particular function. Let's say how within the cytoplasm here in the within the cell, uh, you want to contain all your mitochondria, all of the ribosomes, all of the nucleus and etc, all of them in there. You can't have them floating about with the rest of tissue fluid because that would mean that a lot of the chemical reactions, um, important cellular reactions can't actually occur. In the same context, if you think about uh, within mitochondria, they do aerobic respiration and you want to have all of the essential enzymes within that particular organelle. You don't want them floating about in the cytoplasm again, so uh, otherwise it won't actually have the reaction occurring. If we extend onto that a little bit more, sometimes that, as you would notice here, that there are certain different structures on the actual membrane. And these, um, these proteins here, or these components, are crucial in doing certain chemical reactions. Uh, in the case of mitochondria, uh, and also chloroplasts actually, a lot of the enzymes that are crucial for photosynthesis and respiration exist on the membrane rather than inside the mitochondria or inside the chloroplast. So therefore the membrane actually also serves as a place where the proteins exist to do certain chemical reactions. They're a site for chemical reactions themselves. So that's um, uh, some general ideas about functions of uh, the membrane. And obviously in the context of the plasma membrane or the cell surface membrane, the phospholipid bilayer itself would allow uh, the shielding of certain um, molecules. As you would know from GCSE, uh, the membrane is about controlling what can go in and what can go out, or what can't go in and what can't go out. So in this case, you would see the phospholipid bilayer, because of the hydrophobic core, anything that is hydrophilic can't actually just uh, go across the membrane directly like that through the gaps. They will have to do some other things. So that's one, one uh, particular function there. 
Now, if we look at some of the components within this particular membrane, you would see uh, in particular there are these two things. Uh, these, all of these blocks here are actually proteins. And there are, you can see the different types of proteins. We can have uh, intrinsic protein, the proteins that are actually embedded within the membrane, or we can have an extrinsic protein which exists on the surface. And these proteins would serve slightly different functions. Some of them will be involved in chemical reactions, some of them will be involved in signaling, etc. So now we're going to look at specific examples of some of the intrinsic proteins. So we're going to start with this one. So this one here is actually a carrier protein. So you can see it at the moment it's facing inwards, but actually the carrier protein is able to change its shape using energy to face outwards as well. So the carrier protein is used to transport molecules across the membrane. And because it uh, uses energy to change its shape in order to transport these proteins, we say that they are mainly involved in active transport. Having said that, sometimes they can also be involved in passive transport. And the difference between these two is that active transport actually uses energy in order to change its shape to pump something up uh, against the concentration gradient. Whereas if it does something called facilitated diffusion, it means they are delivering things down the concentration gradient without using energy, but they have to go for the carrier protein because they are, let's say, polar or hydrophilic, so they can't just go straight through the membrane. So that's why we sometimes use the carrier protein in order to do these things. This is especially important, um, especially when it comes to uh, particular membranes that need to absorb uh, important uh, molecules. For th as for this one, as you can see, it's slightly different. It's a another intrinsic protein, but this time there is a gap in between, and, and it looks a bit like a channel, so therefore this is called the channel protein. So the channel protein uh, allows facilitated diffusion, which means it allows certain molecules to go down the concentration gradient across the membrane. So as I mentioned before, the phospholipid body has a hydrophobic core inside, uh, and meaning anything that is uh, polar cannot pass through them. But sometimes we need certain things that are polar, like ions, uh, mineral ions, for example, and also water is a polar molecule. So for them, they can't go straight for the membrane, they would need to use these channel proteins. And it's worth mentioning that both the carrier protein and the channel protein can be selective, meaning that you can have a specific channel protein for one specific molecule. For example, in the case of water, you would have something called aquaporins, which is a water-specific channel protein. They only allow water to go through. Whereas some other cases you will have, uh, let's say, sodium ion channel proteins or potassium ion channel proteins, in which they will only allow their specific um, ion to pass through them. So this adds in the select, uh, selective nature to the plasma membrane. So if it's just simply the, uh, a simple phospholipid bilayer, we call it partially permeable, just simply allow, uh, meaning that anything that's polar cannot get through. But with carrier proteins and channel proteins, it then the whole membrane becomes selectively permeable because they actually can select certain things to go through uh, in that case. So the carrier proteins and the channel proteins are uh, responsible for allowing substances to pass through. Then uh, on the next bit, we will have these two different things there. As you can see, for this uh, phospholipid uh, and for this protein, they, all, uh, they both have this branching, right? Now this particular branch, or these branches anyways, uh, they're actually carbohydrate chains. So there are basically a chain of sugar. And the sugar chain itself can act as a receptor or an antigen. So uh, depending on if it's attached to a protein or a phospholipid, they would have slightly different names. For example, in this bit, if it's a sugar chain or carbohydrate chain attached to a phospholipid, we call this the glycolipid. Whereas for this one, which is a carbohydrate chain attached to a protein, we then call it a glycoprotein. Now both of them actually serve similar functions or sometimes you can even say that they're the same. Uh, and it mainly relies on the uh, sugar chain there. So they, like I, said, met, uh, like I said earlier, they could be acting as an antigen, so a particular recognition uh, site for other particular molecules or cells. So for example, that we say, if this is my own cell, then they would be recognized by the white blood cells, for example, as self-antigens. And if these are, this membrane is on a bacterial membrane, and when it enters our body, the white blood cells will recognize them as a foreign antigen, so because their sugar chain would be of a slightly different shape, for example. So they can be acting as antigen for uh, cell recognition, or what sometimes we can call them cell markers instead. 
uh, in other cases, they can be acting as a cell re um, receptor. So they could be receiving certain, uh, let's say, growth hormones or other molecules to signal the rest of the cell to do certain things. And in quite a lot of the cases, would be like glycoprotein because the protein here could be actually in a particular enzyme or it's a protein that can activate other enzymes uh, on the membrane to do certain functions. So they could be receptors for uh, cell signaling. So there we have it, the glycoproteins and the glycolipids that work as uh, communication for uh, with the other cells outside of, of this particular cell. And as you probably have noticed as well, that uh, some of these proteins have different regions. You've got the blanked out regions and the dotted regions. Now, uh, keeping in mind that we said that the phospholipid here, the middle bit is a hydrophobic core, and you can see that dotted areas actually face the hydrophobic uh, fatty acid cells. So, um, and we say because these proteins that are made up of different amino acids, they have managed to arrange themselves so that the particular part of the protein that faces the that has to interact with the fatty acids will be uh, hydrophobic amino acids, whereas the amino acids that face the outside of the cell or inside the cell, or even within this channel here, they would have to interact with other hydrophilic molecules like such as water. So therefore the amino acids uh, surrounding these blanked areas would be hydrophilic. And the last component here is cholesterol. And as you can see, this is arranged like so. And we say the function of the cholesterol on the membrane is to uh, regulate fluidity. So they are the ones that actually could affect and making, uh, either making the membrane very rigid or less rigid, depending on the concentration of that. But the key idea is always use the phrase, regulates fluidity that is majorly important because sometimes uh, the exam boards uh, and the mask games may not accept other wording so just be very careful and as you can see there are two different regions there so if i kind of extend it a little bit you can see here um, based on how they're arranged you can probably guess as well the uh the black dot represents one part of the head uh, that's actually hydrophilic right and we say that uh, if you look at the structure of cholesterol, which is a four carbon ring structure, um, this hydrophilic part is actually a simple hydroxyl group. And then the, uh, the rest of the cholesterol molecule, which is a four carbon ring itself, would be hydrophobic, like so. So if we look back to this one here, that's why the head that is hydrophilic, the hydroxyl group there, will interact with the rest of the hydrophilic phosphate heads. And then the rest of the body, which is the four carbon ring, will interact with the hydrophobic core, like so. So there you have it, that is the fluid mosaic model. To summarize, the membrane is mainly a phospholipid bilayer, which has uh, the first, uh, hydrophilic heads facing outwards or inwards to the water and the hydrophobic core inside, which prevents anything hydrophilic or polar to pass through the membrane, simple, simply like that. Uh, but for those uh, polar molecules that want to pass through, they would rely on carrier proteins and channel proteins, which provide a particular pathway for them to pass through. And we call that pathway either facilitated diffusion, if it's down the concentrating gradient, or active transport, if it is against the concentrating gradient. Then we've also got glycolipids and glycoproteins, uh, mainly focusing on the uh, carbohydrate chain that they have, which acts uh, as uh, antigens for cell recognition or receptors for cell signaling. And then finally, we've got the cholesterol, which uh, regulates fluidity of the entire cell surface membrane.